There are only sets in the formal world of set theory. The empty set, the set containing the empty set. However, we don't even have the natural numbers so far, such as 0, 1, 2. As with everything in set theory, numbers are going to be encoded by sets. We just have to clarify by which ones. It is quite natural to represent 0 as the empty set. 1 could be the singleton set containing the empty set. 2 could be the singleton set containing 1 and so on. We could introduce natural numbers this way, but it is not too practical for a few reasons. First, it would be hard to generalize this approach to ordinal numbers. How should we represent the ordinal omega? This way? And what about omega plus 1? We can draw an infinite sequence of nested rectangles here, but first it is contradicting the axiom of regularity, and second, if we draw omega plus 1 this way, it doesn't have any formal meaning at all. This is not the way to go. And maybe an even more significant disadvantage of defining natural numbers this way is that we would like to use natural numbers for measuring the sizes of finite sets, optimally using a matching with the appropriate natural number. However, with numbers introduced this way, every natural number except 0 would be a one element set. It would be more practical if every natural number determined the number of its elements. These are the reasons why natural numbers are usually built as follows. 0 is the empty set. 1 is the singleton set containing the empty set. So far it is the same. 2 should be a set with two elements. So far we have constructed 0 and 1. So 2 will contain 0 and 1. 3 contains 0, 1 and 2 and so on. Such a definition of natural numbers is handy in several aspects, but virtually no mathematician imagines natural numbers as a mass of nested sets. But one expansion can be handy to sometimes interpret one natural numbers, say 5, as the set of all the numbers less than 5. Programmers could like this view. For example, this video is written in Python. In this programming language, you often use the function range. This function takes a natural number and outputs the list of all the previous natural numbers. You typically use it when you want to repeat a process n times, and that happens quite frequently in programming. The nice thing about formal set theory is that you don't need a function range at all, because every number can be considered as the appropriate list. Now, let's go back to pure mathematics with infinities. The generalization of natural numbers to ordinal numbers is really straightforward. The ordinal omega is again the set of all the previous numbers, so it is the set of all the natural numbers. So not only the ordinal omega corresponds to the set of natural numbers by its order type, it is nothing else than the set of natural numbers. Then the ordinal omega plus 1 is the set of all the natural numbers together with omega, and we could continue. With ordinal numbers introduced formally, many things become simpler. We don't have to say that the ordinal union is something like the union. Since all the ordinals share their elements, it is simply just union, exactly the one guaranteed by the axiom of union. Similarly, in chapter 5, we discussed two roles or ordinal numbers either representatives of a well-ordered set or an index of a bigger ordinal number. And we don't have to say that the small ordinals somehow point into the bigger ordinals. They are simply just their elements. Another nice view is through the graph of set membership. When we have two ordinal numbers, alpha and beta, then we can tell if alpha is smaller than beta by looking at whether the set beta contains alpha as an element. This was denoted by a blue arrow from alpha to beta in the chapters about the formal world of sets. So if we draw these membership arrows between ordinals, the arrows are going to point from the smaller ordinal numbers to the bigger ones. Actually, this graph of set membership describes the ordering exactly in the same way as we have discussed it in chapter 10a about applications of the Cartesian product. The only difference is that now the arrows don't denote a subset of the Cartesian product, but the pure core of the formal world of sets. We can define a general ordinal number this way. It is such a set that is well ordered by the graph of set membership and there is nothing extra. By that I mean that nothing else than members of the ordinal number can point to other members of the ordinal number. 
This property of not containing anything extra is usually called transitivity of the set. So academically speaking, an ordinal number is a transitive set that is well ordered by the set membership. In the rest of the chapter, we are going to look at the axiomatic construction of two important ordinal numbers, in particular omega and omega 1. Let's start with omega. When we introduced the axioms, we said in a bit simplified way that the axiom of infinity states that there is the set of all the natural numbers. In such a case, there would be no work to be done because omega is nothing else than the set of all the natural numbers. However, mathematicians prefer simpler axioms and slightly more complicated proofs. So it is a bit more complicated. In fact, the axiom of infinity exactly states the following. There is a set S, which contains the empty set, and with every set X, it also contains the set X with X added as an element. This means that once X contains the empty set, it must contain also the empty set into which we add the empty set as an element. Such a set is also called the number 1 and the empty set is also called 0. We continue. 1 is the set containing 0. If we add 1 into it as an element, we obtain a set containing 0 and 1, that is the number 2. When we add the number 2 into 2, we obtain the number 3, and so on. It follows that the set S must contain all the natural numbers. However, the axiom of infinity doesn't guarantee that there is nothing else in the set. There could be further ordinal numbers or just any arbitrary crazy sets. Fortunately, we have the axiom of separation, so we can get rid of all the extra elements and keep only the natural numbers. Just after that, we obtain omega, the set of all the natural numbers. It is not far away from the axiom of infinity, but there was a necessary step with the axiom of separation. Now, let's revisit the construction of the ordinal omega 1 from chapter 7, as we didn't have the axioms in the appropriate chapter. We start with omega, the set of all the natural numbers we have just constructed. Furthermore, consider the Cartesian product omega times omega. This can be visualized as a graph having an arrow between every pair of objects in both directions. Well, we should also have loops here. I'm not drawing them, it is already quite messy. Given the Cartesian product, we consider its power set. This means that every element of the resulting power set will be a subset of the Cartesian product, a directed graph on the natural numbers. Sometimes a subset determines an ordering of natural numbers. There is an arrow between each pair of elements and there are no cycles, so we can rearrange the set of natural numbers so that the arrows go from left to right. In such cases, we represent the subset of the Cartesian product as the appropriate order and all such orders form a set. We can get this set using the axiom of separation. Sometimes we obtain even a well-ordered set. There is no infinite decreasing sequence in the ordering. So we have a further subset inside the set of all the orderings, the set of all the well orders of natural numbers. And that is the set we use for building omega 1. Given any well ordered set, we use transfinite recursion and build the appropriate ordinal number by repetitive application of the axiom of replacement. In every step of the recursion, we consider an initial segment of the well ordered set and we transform it into the appropriate set of ordinal numbers. So we start with an empty initial segment. This is transformed into the empty set, 0. Then the initial segment containing the first element is transformed into a set containing 0, that is 1. The next initial segment leads to 2, the next to 3, and so on. The limit step is exactly the same. The initial segment before 0 is transformed into the set of all the natural numbers, into omega. We continue with the other ordinal numbers and in the end we apply the axiom of replacement to the entire set of natural numbers and we obtain the appropriate formal ordinal number. This way we have assigned a formal ordinal number to a certain well order on the natural numbers and we can do the same with any well order on natural numbers. So whenever we get a well order on natural numbers we construct the appropriate ordinal number. Since we have all the well orders on natural numbers in a single set, 
we can apply the axiom of replacement once again and transform the set of all the well orders on natural numbers into the set of all the formal ordinal numbers of cardinality L0. And that is almost omega 1. Omega 1 consists of all the countable ordinal numbers. They are finite ordinal numbers and then ordinals of size L0, which are already captured in a single set. So the last remaining step is to add the finite ordinal numbers, the natural numbers, simply by taking a union with omega. And that's it. I guess this formal construction of one unimaginable set isn't among the most exciting parts of set theory, but I considered it nice to show the axiom of replacement even a bit more and also to clarify the slightly foggy construction from chapter 7. In the next chapter, we are going to proceed from natural numbers to real numbers. And as a side effect, we will solve a bit surprising problem about infinite chains. See you then!